My name is Jaden, and I'm a commercial photographer, also an art director. So I shoot almost everything under the sun. I shoot people, I shoot food, I shoot landscape, and also I do a bit of art direction work. Basically just uh, conceptualizing ideas for creative projects. So I always have an interest in fashion, and in 2016, I started my National Day Portrait Series, centered around the typical Singaporean girl next door, but with a twist. I included things from everyday life that you won't see as part of a costume. And I've created a new set every year since. I guess the main reason for starting this series is because I wanted to first celebrate Singapore and also to look at what it means to be Singaporean. So for this year's National Day Portraits, I want to do it a bit differently. I want to set it in the late 1960s, during the exciting first few years following Singapore's independence in 1965. I want to really explore the history of Singapore, particularly to find out how is it different in the 1960s and what does it mean to be a Singaporean back then and um, hopefully to get some inspiration from people then and put it together into the portrait series. The 1960s must have been very different for Singaporeans back then. They must have been super proud to be Singaporean in the years after independence. Maybe back then, it was trendy to wear bright, flashy red clothes with crescent and star-shaped patterns and big lion manes as hairdos stuffed with orchids. I mean, it was the 60s, when everything was big, loud and colourful, right? So with my past series of portraits, they are inspired by things that are more accessible to me. I use chili packets, old school snacks, and even parking lot coupons to create costumes that to me represent Singapore today. So for this new series, I'll need to find iconic things from the late 60s that represented Singapore then. So next step, I'm thinking about what's iconic. And that led me to think about the national costumes we see every year in the pageants. And I wonder, what does it look like in 1960s? So I meet with the men behind some of Singapore's wildest, most extravagant pageant dresses. Mo Kasim, who would probably win Mr. Congeniality himself. Could you share with me some of your works and inspiration? My inspiration comes from, it can be food, can be architecture, can be about national flowers, monuments and things like that. One of the costumes that I've done is actually the orchid, Vandermeer's Joking, which is just right behind you. Every year, Mo goes on a hunt for icons that can represent the Singaporean identity and turns them into pageant dresses, from national symbols like the Malayan, to our unofficial national bird, the Crimson Sunbird, and historic events like the meeting of these two frenemies. And now, to ask the golden question I came here for. Does Mo know anything about what pageant costumes in the late 60s looked like? I wasn't born during that era, but I think during those years, I would say they, they, they liked to represent their own race. They would wear just a kabaya, or they would just wear a chongsam, or even lenga or sari for the Indian. And that would be the iconic costume to represent Singapore. Your impression of the 1960s mm -hmm. is there's lesser fusion and yeah. more just one just, direction. Yeah, 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 I see. Yeah, yeah. How would you make your own version of the national costume had it been 1960s? As a designer, I will of course I will go back to my roots. Yeah, uh, being Malay, I will go back to the kabaya, which is form fitting, using like the songket, which is actually traditional fabric and embroidery, like the one we have it in on oh, yeah? Wow. Yeah. So, I really cannot imagine stepping into the world of Mo and having listened to his inspirations and his creative processes behind making all the national costumes. And it's very interesting to listen how um, he does it over the years. But I'm disappointed that Mo thinks 
pageant costumes in the 60s were just traditional ethnic wear. I was hoping to find something that's a little more groundbreaking. So I make my way down to the National Library in the hopes of finding a different take on our pageant costumes in the 60s. And sadly, I find that what Mo said was actually true. Traditional dresses, particularly the Malay kabaya, were our go-to pageant costume to represent Singapore on the international stage. But there is one article from 1967 that gives me a glimmer of hope. Okay, this is an interesting article. It says, Princess Singapore, Miss Heather Siddons modelled yet another version of what Singapore's national dress should be. And this time, it is the Chong Ah Rong. Chong Ah Rong, a fusion of the Chong Sam, Sari and Sa Rong in one single outfit. Features a Chinese collar with frog fastenings down the front. A Malay skirt Sa Rong and a detachable sash to represent the Indian Sari. So I wasn't expecting back then to have such a um, bold and daring move to combine all the different outfits together, uh, different cultures together. Finally, something different that I can use for my photo series. But it also got me thinking. 1967 was two years after Singapore became independent. Was the Cheong Arong a sign of a new and exciting Singaporean identity? I am a photographer, and every year, I create a portrait series celebrating what it means to be Singaporean. This year, I'm setting it in the late 60s, and I'm on the hunt for iconic fashion elements that can represent these early years of Singapore's independence. I've just found a 1967 Singapore pageant costume that boldly fused the Chong Sam, Sari and Sarong together. I wonder, was this costume a sign that a brand new Singaporean identity was emerging? Were Singaporeans beginning to see and dress themselves differently? So I seek out a fashion history expert for answers. I was wondering if you have any insights on how fashion uh, was affected by Singapore's independence? Before independence, was the period of the Malayan identity, there is a clear idea that we belong with Malaya. So I'm sure that after independence, there is um, a clear idea that we want to mark ourselves out, right, as Singapore. In terms of fashion, people were beginning to create and imagine something different. And this, she says, is where early fashion magazines come in handy. You look through all the different fashion magazines, you will see that there are snapshots of society over a period of time. They capture what is on the ground level, what people are interested in. That's the role that they play in society, right? In reflecting the taste, the desires of its readers. Industrialization, modernization. Gina tells me that these were some of the big words describing what our country was going through. And this made Singaporeans dream bigger, especially women. In the early 60s, a woman's dream was to own a rice cooker or an electric iron to go with a feminine, modest Malayan wardrobe. But by the late 60s, the woman became a working woman who favoured shorter hemlines and unisex styles to match her new, modern lifestyle. I see that fashion was more than just clothes. Fashion was a statement of one's independence and individuality. And hair was a very, very important part of the kind of entire look. If you were attending any kind of social event, then um, you had to do your hair up. You right? must look like you have sat on the salon chair for at least three to four hours. <laughs> That's right. Are there any distinctive Singaporean style? Yes, definitely. So these were wow. all very common looks. Some very quirky hairdos of the 60s included the intricate bunga raya, which literally means festive flower in Malay. The lion look, which resembled a lion's mane as well as the Lion City hairdo, which featured a perky swirl popular with younger women. And beyond the hair, Gina tells me that Singapore also had a vibrant local design scene. So this is um, Fashion Bonanza 1969, right? And this was a very big event with the local fashion designers. You have people like Roland of Coral, 
So Feitan, Beistan, all these famous designers of that time coming together and we get to see a lot of renditions of local ideas. One of it was batik that's been refashioned, and that's the idea that we want to kind of upgrade something that is our traditional costume, and we want to keep it going right, as part of like modern wear. So I learned um, a lot more about the fashion in the 1960s of Singapore. And the big thing that stood out to me was the very elaborate hairdo. So it seemed to me hair is very important and it's a symbol of status. I'm really happy to know that our local fashion scene was buzzing with very local Singaporean ideas. And these are elements that I can certainly use for my outfits. So after looking at all these references, there's this one particular name that keeps coming up and he's Roland Chow. Roland Chow seemed to be a very popular local designer. I'm curious to know what went on in the mind of this fashion guru that I can weave into my photo series. Unfortunately, Roland has already passed on. So, I go to the next best source I can find, Roland's former apprentice, Francisco Raquiza. Could you share a bit more about Roland Chow and his designs? Well, don't you know that he was being named as the Christian Dior of the East? Christian Dior of the East? Yes. Wow. He had a vision to make Singapore become an Eastern Paris to bring forward the fashion scene, including hair and fashion together. Well, isn't this something to chow on? Francisco tells me Roland always knew how to put on a show. He was well known for marrying the best of both worlds, the East and the West, putting a local twist on global fashion trends. Like this two-piece batik tunic to suit the round-the-clock lifestyle of the working girl. And this batik combi with a mini skirt to boot to knock the socks off your date. Roland's collections in the 60s were true tests of his creativity, setting new trends for the local fashion scene every year. And Francisco shares that Roland's trailblazing designs pretty much reflected the spirit of the times he lived in. In the late 60s, people is more bold and more experimenting. Forget grabbing clothes off the rack, the 60s was a period of tailor-made clothes which meant people were free to come up with their own designs and customise details right down to every stitch. This is the only way to, ah. to be different. You don't want to walk out together and see everyone wearing the same clothes. Yeah. Compare now and then, people care about what they wear, how they look. You don't see anyone walking out from the house without makeup or without doing the hair. So it's not like the um, fast fashion of today. So do you think this new wave of um, self-expression is influenced by Singapore's independence? I would say that it's just a transitioning. The new school is accepting everything and welcoming all this new idea. But then again, I also heard about this movement that we shouldn't dress in a certain way and men shouldn't have hair longer than a year. But I have no experience through that period because I was very young. So it's like a long hair band? It's a long hair band. Well, I think it's so interesting talking to Francisco. I find it very heartening that Roland would always add a Singaporean spin to his designs. And Francisco also shared people back in the days, they put more details and, and more attention into how they want to look. There was a lot of customization and a lot of tailor-made stuff, something that I wish um, there were more of today. This spirit of experimentation is definitely something I want to convey in my photo series. But Francisco also mentioned a long hair band for men, which sounds so bizarre, I can't stop wondering what in the good name of Roland Chow was this band? I am a photographer, and every year I've created portraits celebrating Singapore's National Day. For this year, I want to create one set in the late 1960s, when Singapore was newly independent. So far, I've learned that it was a vibrant period of self-expression. But I also just heard about the long hair band. Operation Snip Snip. Sounds like when I have to neuter my cat. 
I learned that Operation Snip Snip was a nationwide hunt for men with hair longer than their ears and collars. They were the last to be served in government offices and were even denied entry into the country. This was part of the wider anti-yellow movement launched in 1959 to curb negative Western influences through films, books and publications. So what I'm reading right now is interestingly different from uh, what Francisco described. What he mentioned was the very vibrant era where right now I'm reading it as a very conservative policies going on. This really intrigues me. I'm sure there must have been some people who rebelled against these rules. This spirit of rebellion is definitely something I'd like to explore in my portraits. And no one knows more about bending the rules than a rock and roll star. If London had the Beatles, then Singapore had the Quests, and Vernon was their dashing frontman. I asked Vernon what he remembers about the anti-yellow movement. In 1959, we had self-government, and the culture minister, Mr. S. Rajaratnam, he decided that rock and roll was bad influence for the youth of Singapore. The close of rock and roll were discouraged in this country because by this time, gangsterism was at its peak. Vernon says that it was because rock and roll clothes, which featured long hair, high collars and tight drainpipe pants, were the favourite fashion style of gangsters. Even rock and roll music was thought to stir up gangsterism, so that was eventually prohibited as well. If you were seen somewhere wearing drainpipe pants, the police would take you to the station, ask you your background, whether you're in any gangs. It was an unwritten code, but if a beer bottle couldn't slip through your pants, then it was too tight. Wow. <laughs> How do you think the Singaporeans then uh, rebel against, against this kind of restriction? Well, you know, uh, the usual thing is when they say no, it makes it more interesting to have. What you cannot have, you must have. A very prominent event every Sunday for young people and at very low expense was tea dance. Vernon tells me that tea dancers became safe havens for youths to come in clothes they were not allowed to be seen in publicly, grooving to the rock and roll music that was no longer playing on the airwaves. What the authorities were afraid of, that one's teen years can be the most influenced. So they were putting these guards. So records were banned, but we could still buy records in Johor Bahru, or silently somebody would import them. So that was, that was part of the youth rebellion. So, what do you think makes Singaporeans Singaporean in the 60s? I think nationhood made us realise that we were special. Because don't forget that as the music grew, so did Singapore. 1965, a republic. So we were now spreading our wings, not just as a country, but as individuals wanting to expand, be more creative. We were proud being Singaporeans because like our band, when we travel, we were a Singapore product. Yeah, yeah. Wow, meeting Vernon was is really cool and it was very insightful. Among all the things he shared, I think one of it was very interesting to me was the kind of a ridiculous laws. You cannot have pants too tight or you cannot hang out in jukeboxes. The interesting bit about it is seeing how the youth culture rebel against it and not trying to conform to everything people made them to be. So I think uh, uh, that serves as an inspiration for how I can think a bit more out of the box. Now, with the shoot approaching, I enlist my friend Josiah to help me finalise the concept. In my research, right, um, I found out that it was raining on the first National Day Parade. I think that um, is quite iconic. And it rained again in 1968. To me, seeing Singaporeans huddled together, braving the rain to watch the parade, is a really moving image. 
So I thought of using something to do with rain or uh, water, raincoats. And then I, I found this umbrella that I think maybe it can be the main motif of the shoot. So it becomes like a very quirky fashion piece. It looks so cute. Yeah, so, but the thing is, obviously the fabric is not nice now. So um, I was thinking, how can we manipulate the fabric? Uh, I went to look for some textiles. Okay. Um, so this is what I have. Okay. Likely, we can just create a pattern for the different panels. Uh -huh. So it's like stitching different fabrics together, mesh, meshing everything together. Uh -huh. So this is kind of like a good the base. solid base. A good okay. base to okay. have, yeah. I think we should definitely consider like working some hairstyles into uh -huh. the shoot. I can show you the references from the hairstyle books back then. Or it's like an art piece on her head. Yeah, and a lot of hairspray. Then you have a Lion City look. Oh. I think maybe we can work some of it into the, yeah, yeah, the photo shoot as well. The fringe and then the sideburns. Together, we come up with three different looks. The first look is inspired by the Cheong Ah Rong, a combination of different ethnic wear, including the Malay kebaya, like the one shown by Mo. Good, nice, good. Yes. The second look is inspired by the loud retro prints from the fashion magazines shown by Gina and designs from Roland's collections. Good, nice, nice, good, good. And lastly, a tribute to our first National Day Parade in 1966, with a deconstructed military outfit to represent that spark of rebellion that Vernon shared with me. Good, so I look this way a little bit. Yep, good, nice. We got a shot, we got a shot. We got a shot, we got a shot. Ah, this one, this one. Oh, this is really, really nice. So I think Singapore has been very safe for many, many years. And that in and itself has led us to a very monotonous kind of a way of doing things. These past few days has been quite a journey. And I almost feel like I was transported back to the 1960s. It's really difficult to pinpoint the exact Singaporean identity. My main takeaway from this whole project is that with Singapore's independence, it comes with a new wave of hope and excitement. And my only wish is for this um, whole free-spiritedness to be carried on into the future.